This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Groups. What is a group? Well, uh, a, a group can be defined as any collection of people who perceive themselves to be a group. It's important uh, to realize that a group can therefore be a formal group. In other words, management sets up a group, like a project team to put in a new IT system, or it can be informal and perhaps uh, unknown by management uh, a group can be a, a group of workers who uh, decide that they want to protect their uh, posi positions at work or who decide they're not going to work any harder because they don't think the pay is right uh, and they therefore regard themselves as a group of people. Uh, it's been informal, management may not know about that. The characteristics of a group, whether formal or informal, is that it will have a sense of purpose or aim to uh, implement the new IT system, to prevent redundancies, uh, to uh, uh, try to increase our pay, whatever the, 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 the group is, sees its aim as. It has an identity. We know who's in the group, we know who's outside the group, who's a member, who's not a member. There are group norms. We've discussed norms before. These are accepted ways for group members to perform. And if you want to be within the group, accepted by the group, you have to comply with these group norms. If you depart from group norms, you're liable to be expelled. And then there is communication. We really mean here communication within the group. Uh, they have to talk to each other to uh, keep their sense of purpose, to decide on group norms, to uh, have plan how they're going to get their particular aim and so on achieved. Now, a, a writer called Meredith Belbin uh, uh, identified eight or nine different roles within teams or groups. Now, the great thing about a group or a team, now when you talk about a team, uh, you, you tend to be talking about something which has been deliberately formed. Uh, but if you think of a football team, you know there's a range of skills in there. Uh, there is someone who's good at goalkeeping. There is someone who's good at scoring. There's someone who's good at defense uh, and so on. And one of the, the things about teams is you, you, you certainly want a mix of skills. So in the IT implementation team, you need someone who knows about IT. Uh, you probably have somebody from the accounting department who keeps an eye on the budget uh, and who also may, in fact, be intimately involved with uh, the output that the IT system is going to be uh, producing. You may need somebody from HR who is looking at the implications the new IT system may have on employees. But they all bring their particular skills to it. What Belman was talking about here, these different roles, was more uh, psychological differences that people have. And he said that there were these, um, originally he said there were these eight uh, types of person, if you like, within a team. Well, just look at some of them. They're set out fully in, in your, your notes here. Uh, but there is a, a chairman. So chairman is psychologically good at trying to ensure that everybody in the team has their say, very good at maybe summarizing where people have got to, quite good at maybe directing where the, the group should move on to. The shaper is, is a fairly um, powerful person. They know what they want. Uh, and they are not shy uh, about trying to ensure that they get what they want. The uh, completer finisher, if we go down to the bottom and work up a couple, completer finisher is someone who is very good at detail. So if you're getting a, a report produced for a client, it's a completer finisher who will be very good at making sure all the cross-references are correct, uh, and proofing the document to make sure there aren't any typing errors and so on. 
And this is a, a role that, that many other people are not very good at. They get more excited at the start of a, a project rather than at the end. And finally, I just mentioned a plant here. A plant is someone who is deliberately put into a group uh, to ginger it up. Someone who will maybe come up with slightly off-the-wall outrageous ideas planted in the group. And these outrageous ideas are encouraged really to make the, uh, the rest of the group, as we would say, think outside the box a little bit, to shake it up a little bit. He also at the end said there might be one other uh, type of person you have there as a specialist. So you might want to bring into your IT implementation uh, group, you might want to bring in a, a specialist on IT security for at least some of the meetings who can give advice there. So Belvin said a well-constituted group or team will have elements of all of these psychological skills. It doesn't mean you have to have eight or nine people. Uh, because someone might be might be quite good at a number of these kind of simultaneously, so somebody might be quite good at being a completer, finisher, resource investigator, and and a team worker. Somebody else might be a shaper. Somebody else might be a, a chairman, a monetary evaluator, and so on. There, but you need you need these kind of elements of psychological expertise as well as the uh, uh, as well as the um, other skills, the specific skills that they are bringing in to share in the team. He also said you have to be careful maybe of uh, getting too many uh, people of the same psychological type. So if you had two shapers, these are two powerful, rather headstrong people who know what they want uh, and will argue for that, and if these two shapers want different things, then it is likely to produce a, a situation of considerable aggression within the group, and you might want to avoid that. Tuckman is the other name you need to know. Uh, Tuckman said that the formation of groups goes through, on the, the life of groups, goes through a number of different stages. First of all, there's forming. So if you think of an informal group, how does it form? It's going to form very slowly uh, as people begin talking to each other. And then they maybe say, well, maybe we should be you know, thinking about how we're going to get a better pay rise, or how we're going to stop redundancy, and so on. So initial forming. Then there's storming. This is people kind of feeling their way with regards to other people. Who's going to be the leader of the group, the spokesperson? Who's going to be the person who does the research? Who's going to be the person who maybe takes the minutes and so on? That is jockeying really for position. Who's going to do what? Then we had norming. So we know who's doing things. Now we have to settle down to a, what we call a modus operandi, a method of actually carrying out the group work. What are the norms going to be? Are we going to meet weekly? Are we going to meet monthly? Uh, uh, how compulsory is it for everybody to be there? Uh, what happens if you're given a task one week and you haven't done it by the next week? And so on. What are the ways in which we expect people to behave within the group? That's norming. And none of this is yet to the stage where we produced any output. And the fourth stage is performing. So we formed a group, we know who's doing what, we know how often it's going to meet, and what sort of formality it's going to have, and so on, the norming. Uh, and only now do we get output coming from the group. And what management can do is to accelerate this. Because this is the only stage where we're getting anything useful out. So management can say, these five people are going to be in the group. Management can say, you're going to be the leader, you're going to be the person who's responsible for taking the minutes. Management can say, you're going to meet every week on a Friday afternoon. So all of these first three stages are kind of accelerated through. Uh, and 
were straight into really the performing section were people will then maybe meet for every week for the next three months or whatever it takes and they actually begin to achieve what the team was set up to achieve. The final stage which might arise is dorming. And this is where we have met for the last three months. Essentially we have achieved what we have to achieve but we keep on meeting uh, because uh, we always meet on a Friday. So we keep meeting even though there's not much to do. So dorming, as in sleeping, uh, it's a, a, a kind of habit which we're doing, uh, but we're not actually achieving anything anymore. And after the performance is finished, rather than you know, kind of go on in the foreseeable future, having rather useless meetings, the team, the group really ought to be disbanded. Finally, just a, a little definition almost of teams and committees. Teams are deliberately formed. Think of the football team. There are specific objectives which are given to them uh, and usually deadlines given to them. They will be formed with the right mix of actual skills and also psychological profiles vis-a-vis -vis Belbin and so on. And there will be a leader of the team. And they do work. You know, they will be responsible for making sure that the new IT system is implemented properly. Then there is a committee. Uh, a committee is less active, it is rather more decision making. And again, what we have is rather than a leader, they're usually called a chair or chairperson or chairman uh, there. Again, they will have mixed skills. It, it gives people from different departments a forum in which they can make their views known on this committee. They will come to formal decisions. They will come to formal recommendations. So they might come to a recommendation that the old IT system is beyond rescue and we need a new IT system. So the committee has come to that decision. And then the next stage might be to form an implementation team who actually then looks after the purchase and choice and implementation and testing and so on of the new IT system.